Alhamdulillah, it's a great honor, great pleasure to be here in such a beautiful masjid, uh, such a, a stately, uh, awe-inspiring edifice. May Allah Ta'ala protect it. May Allah, Ta'ala, may Allah Ta'ala bless all of the youngsters here to assume their proper role as the years and decades pass in managing uh, organizing and maintaining the masjid so that it's never in a situation that befell the community that preceded the Muslims where their young people turned away from the religion by and large and the church was sold to the Muslims so we pray that there never comes a day when the Muslims because the masjid has been abandoned will be sold to who knows the whatever, discotheque, I don't know. We pray that day never comes. May Allah preserve this place, preserve this community. Uh, the title of the talk tonight is Community at the Crossroads. And in a sense, as Muslims, we find ourselves at the crossroads. And that can mean many things, of course. Uh, one thing it means can be taken directly from the Qur'an where the crossroads are mentioned. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنِ فَلَقْطَحَمَ الْأَقَبَى وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا الْأَقَبَى فَكُّ رَقَبَى أَوْ إِطْعَامٌ فِي يَوْمٍ ذِي مَسْقَبَى يَتِيمًا ذَا مَقْرَبَى أَوْ مِسْكِينًا ذَا مَتْرَبَى ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْمَرْحَمَةِ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ So Allah Ta'ala said He's guided the human to the two roads, the two paths. وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنِ So He's guided each and every one of us to a crossroads. And He's guided our communities to a crossroads. And then he mentions that there is a steep path that few people tread to walk on. He's made no progress on the steep path. And what will let you know what the steep path is? Liberating the slave. So we can be a community that looks at the problems or to continue liberating the, the slave. Giving food in a day of starvation. To an orphan who's related. Or to a poor person, dust covered and rejected. Then and only then will he or she, whatever the case is, generic language, he here specifically, but encompassing females also. Then and only then will he be amongst those who truly believe. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْمَرْحَمَةِ And they counsel with patience and they counsel with mercy. أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ These are the companions of the right hand. So, as a community, we find ourselves at a crossroads. We can go on the low path. The low path is the path Every other community is walking, generally speaking. And there are good people in all communities, as we all know from our personal experiences. But we can go on the path in our context of consumerism, 
and we can value ourselves based on how many labels we can affix to our body. We can value ourselves based on whether or not what we're wearing conforms to the current trends and fads and fashions and styles. We can be a community that if the other communities are find themselves burdened with the burdens that accrue from consumption of alcohol, consumption of drugs, illegal, illicit activities such as drug sales and heroin and cocaine and things that other communities find themselves burdened with. Of course, not everyone. So we can have the Muslim drug dealer and we can have the Muslim pornography merchant. We can have the Muslim selling alcohol in his or her store. We can have the Muslim who's obsessed with fashion, making sure they have the latest this, that, or the other on their backs or their feet or their noses even, the proper glasses that reflect the styles. So if the style is the narrow glasses, we get the narrow glasses. And if the style is the big, fat, wide glasses, we throw the narrow ones out and get the big, fat, wide glasses so that our noses are properly adorned. So we can be like everyone else, or we can walk the steep path. What is the steep path? It's the path of service. It's the path of sacrifice. It's the path of denial. Because to liberate the slave means we have to give up some of our wealth. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he was quite wealthy when the call to the prophetic office came to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the things he used his wealth for was to purchase the freedom of Muslims who had been enslaved to the Quraysh. And the most famous story, story that we know of is the story of Bilal ibn Rabah. But there were many others like Bilal whom Abu Bakr radiallahu an used his wealth to purchase their freedom. So Abu Bakr had to give up something in order to have the wealth necessary to purchase the freedom. It's feeding people in a day of starvation. A day of famine. We can be a community whose one of our primary functions is to feed people. Not just locally, but certainly there's a local need. And like many of the great churches that still exist, they have food pantries and feeding centers. We can perform those functions. And they're valuable functions. Some people, they challenge that. Why are Muslims feeding people? Well, we can say in return, number one, because Allah Ta'ala says this is what Muslims do. We fed them for the sake of Allah, literally for the face of Allah, for Allah. The face in many valid uh, interpretation, that Allah. We fed them for Allah. We don't want any recompense, we don't want any, th any thanks. Why? Because this will erode the reward we have with Allah. If we get some of it in this world, we get less in the Akhirah. So we want it all in the Akhirah. We're doing this for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why, that's why we're motivated to feed people. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he's asked, some people say, why are you feeding these people? You don't know who they are. When asked sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ayyul islami afdal. فَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمُ أَنْ تُطْعِمَ الطَّعَامُ وَتُقْرِئَ السَّلَامُ عَلَى مَنْ عَرَفْتَ وَمَنْ لَمْ تَعْرِفْ 
that you which uh, manifestation of Islam is most virtuous. فَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ The Prophet, may the blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, said that you feed people and that you greet people, those you know and those you know not. عَلَى مَنْ عَرَفْتَ وَمَنْ لَمْ تَعْرِفْ That's why we feed people. There is no underlying agenda. There is no... Uh, there are no extenuating circumstances. We feed them for Allah. And we feed them seeking the best, one of the most virtuous manifestations of Islam. And we don't just feed them here. Wherever there might be starvation, wherever there might be famine, then the Muslims should be there. And it's interesting that these are two of the purposes of the zakat. إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتِ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ The zakat is for the poor people, the needy people. وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ Those who work to gather, dispense, disperse it, and, and run, administrate, the wherewithal for the gathering and dispersal, those whose hearts are to be strengthened. People all over the world are being bombarded with negative images of Islam and Muslims, of, of, of false uh, information about who we are as a community. Think of the impact Wherever there's famine, there's starvation amongst Muslims or others that some of the first people on the scene are Muslims. And they're arriving with zakat that's being gathered and collected from Muslims in the Western world. This is what the National Zakat Foundation and similar organizations are trying to do. Think of the impact on the hearts. Think of how much the propaganda will be diffused. These are things we, we need to begin to rally our non young people to do. We can be a community again. We can sit back and blame our young people when they fall into the, the traps that are set for them. And those traps might be set by Muslims. They might be set by people who aren't Muslims. We can complain or we can pr provide healthy avenues of activism. We can organize our young people to go to these places with the zakat to be the people working to dispense it, working to, to uh, make sure that it reaches the places it should reach, working with young people in those communities to build bridges between Muslims in this part of the world and Muslims in other parts of the world that might not be, have the resources that are available here. This is, these are some of the challenges we face. So again, that's a crossroads. We can settle for the status quo, or we can stand up, rise up as a community and begin to do those things that will provide healthy outlets for our children, healthy outlets for the energy that they have, provide avenues for them to build on the vision that they have like all people for a better world. As Rumi said, to paraphrase Rumi, that when I was in my 20s, I wanted to change the world. When I was in my 30s, I wanted to change my land. When I was in my 40s, I wanted to change my family. When I was in my 50s, I wanted to change myself. And then if only I'd reverse the order. That's how life usually progresses, but it's the nature of youth to have a broad vision, to want to change the world. It's only when you grow and mature and you realize how the world works and how challenging change can be that we begin to scale down. And then at the end of the day, we realize that really change starts with ourselves. But it's up to us to put the wherewithal in place so that the vision can become more realistic and the idealism can find a healthy outlet.
Because if there aren't healthy outlets, there'll, there'll be unhealthy outlets will become very attractive. They'll become very attractive. So as a community, it's up to us to provide those outlets. And so these two paths, the path of the status quo and the path of implementing and actualizing the principles that we hold, they're, put, they're laid out before us. If we're going to actualize those principles, we're going to have to organize ourselves because there are daunting challenges for people who want to make a meaningful difference in the world. They're incredible challenges. They're the challenges that are associated with the gathering the necessary resources. So we want to have organizations that assist people both locally and in far off, far off lands who need food, who are undernourished. That takes a tremendous amount of resources to do it consistently and to do it effectively. Those resources require a collective effort and a collective effort has to be built on an institutional foundation. Individual initiatives and collective efforts is, is immediately seen to be oxymoronic. There has to be an institutional foundation, not an individual foundation for a project that requires a collective effort that requires a critical mass of human and material resources. And as a community, if we're going to demonstrate our principles in the realm of reality, this is something that we have to do. I can refer you to a book, uh, The American Policy Ab Advisor, who's a genius, but sometimes a devious genius, genius uh, Spigniew Brzezinski, who was uh, a high-level official in the Carter administration and other administrations. He wrote a book in the 1990s after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. That book was called uh, Out of Control, Global Security on the, End, on, on the Verge of the 21st Century. In that book, he said that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, people of the world have no alternative system to pin their hopes on. And I'm paraphrasing him. And he says in more than one place in that book, Islam could be that alternative, but Muslims don't have a state-level actor that embodies their principles. In other words, a state-level actor that translates the ideals of Islam into viable institutions that people can see. So we all know pious individuals, we know righteous individuals who are Muslim, we know charitable individuals, but societies are affected by institutions. Societies are, are, are affected by institutions. And as Muslims, if we're going to have a positive impact on our societies, we will have to have strong, viable, positive institutions. Because what the institutions do, we were speaking about this earlier, they amplify the principles that an individual might articulate. So I can stand on the corner and I can talk ad nausea about we need to feed people. I might get a little crowd in front of me for a little while and I might move them to tears. But at the end of the day, not too many people are going to be fed because I have limited resources. But I can say nothing I can gather the people in this crowd together and we can organize ourselves and we can put in what money we do have, five pounds here, a hundred pounds there, someone's doing really well, a thousand pounds, and we can rent out a building 
in one of the poor neighborhoods of this city. And we can establish a feeding center. And every month we're all contributing whatever we can. We can stock that center with food. And we can set up tables and we can buy a stove, an industrial commercial stove. And we can cook every day and we can feed a whole lot of people. I couldn't do that by myself. That's a, 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 an illustration of the power of collect, collective action placed into an institutional format. Because what we did was establish an institution. So it is incumbent upon us if we want to walk on that steep path, that first of all, we commit ourselves to it, we commit ourselves to making a difference, and then we come together and establish the institutional infrastructure that can support the vision that informs, that our commitment informs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or let me word this another way. In other words, we can be an ordinary community, and that's the low road. Or we can be an exemplary, exemplary community. That's the high road. If we're going to be an exemplary community, we should understand this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us to. Allah ta'ala isn't, isn't calling us to ordinary. Allah Ta'ala is calling us to extraordinary. Allah Ta'ala mentions in Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhriju linnas. You are the best community. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best community brought forth for the people. Some of our exegetes comment on that and they say, Ayli khidmatin nas, brought forth to serve the people brought forth to serve the people. This is, this is what the Qur'an is calling us to, to be servants of the people. And that's an extra, extraordinary station. That's a station of leadership. Sayyidul Qawm Khadimuhum or Khadimul Qawm Sayyiduhum which is a stronger narration. The leader of a people or the servant of a people is their leader. Leadership lies in service. There's a, a popular book uh, some of you might have heard of. Actually, it's a lecture that's based on a book. The leader is the last to eat. After the Prophet وسلم, who's one of the most renowned leaders of the Muslim community? Abu Bakr, after Abu Bakr, Umar radiallahu anh. What was Umar famous for? Whenever some new food, fresh fruit came in Medina with Umar, like the kings of the day, be the first to get it, maybe the only one to get it, put the rest in the fridge for future use, would he be the first to eat from it or the last? He'd be the last to eat for it, from it. And if it was all gone and dispensed amongst the people, would he pout and say, you know, where's mine? I should have got mine first. I'm the leader. I could have taken it all. He said, Alhamdulillah, the people are satisfied. If the people are satisfied, I'm satisfied. This is the ethos of leadership. And as Muslims, we are called to be leaders. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءً عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَقُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا Thus we have made you a balanced nation in order that you will be witnesses for the people. Balanced meaning not a nation that goes to extremes. And there are two extremes. People who do more than what's required and more than what's asked of them and go beyond the acceptable limits and people who don't do enough. 
One of the meanings of Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, the great Mufassir, Fakhruddin al Razi, great scholar, he was more than Mufassir, in it, his tafsir, Mafatih al Ghayb, he explains when we say Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, we're already Muslims making this prayer. We're Muslims, we praise Allah. People who aren't Muslims don't praise Allah. They might praise God in a general sense based on their religious profession, but they don't specifically praise Allah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, Iyaka Na'budu, we worship you. We're already Muslims, we worship Allah. We Iyaka Nasta'een, and your help that we seek. We're already Muslims, we seek the help of Allah. Ihdina Sirat Al Mustaqeem. So we're not asking Allah to guide us to Islam. We're asking Allah, amongst other things, and there are a lot of explanation, to guide us to the middle path between extremes. Between the extremes of those who go beyond bounds and transgress limits, and the extremes of those who don't do enough. That we're in the middle. Shuhada' ala nas Primarily, this refers to the Akhirah. The Yom al Qiyamah, any people claim we sinned and we were rebellious because no Prophet came to us. We are the people that will bear witness. Indeed, Allah Ta'ala, Almighty God, did send you a messenger. If any of us say, we didn't know what to do, we were in the dark. The Prophet, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, will bear witness against us. I came to you and the Quran was revealed to me and the Quran was written down by my Sahaba and my Sunnah was articulated. Everything you needed to succeed, I left you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it also has a worldly application. Allah Ta'ala mentions concerning the prophetic mission. Ya ayyuhan nabi, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadheera wa da'i'an ilallahi bi idnihi wa sirajan munira. That, O oh, oh, Prophet, we've sent you as a witness, as a giver of glad tidings, as a warner. These are worldly manifestations as a witness. So we are to be exemplary witnesses and amongst other things to show people, yes, it is possible. It is possible to maintain a strong connection with God in a postmodern materialistic world. It is possible to build a life around worship and devotion as Muslims are doing. Ramadan just passed, a whole month where Muslims are defying even their very nature. Our nature demands sleep. Some of you are coming to this masjid praying taraweeh, going home one or two in the morning, eating suhoor, sleeping for two or three hours, getting up, going to work for an entire month. And you did it. But you did it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does Allah ta in Tansurullah Yansurkum? If you help Allah's religion, He will help you. And being witnesses for the religion and standing and fasting and praying for Allah Ta'ala, we survived. It's possible. That's a shahid. That's a, a witness for those people who say you can't do it. For those Muslims who might say you can't do it. We're doing it. We did it. Young guys, some of these young brothers and sisters, like this young brother here, what's your name, young man? Jamal. Jamal did it. Did you pray some tarawi some nights? He's like, no comment. <laughs> Don't, did you fast some days, Ramadan? You did it. Days were long, wasn't it? Long day, summertime, but you did it, right, Jamal? Some days were hot, you still did it. How old are you? 
Seven years old. That's a witness if ever there was a witness. Allahu Akbar. Seven-year-old Jamal fasted 17, 18 hours in Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. Habibi, may Allah bless you. Bless your parents. Give you a long life. Bless your big, big brother. You're his big brother? Yeah, bless, bless your big brother. Alhamdulillah. Witness, shahidan wa mubashiran wa nidhira wa da'iyan ilallahi bi'idnihi wa sirajan munira. So we can be a witness or we can be witnessed against. That's the crossroads. That's one of the crossroads we're at. We can make excuses or we can defy the reasons that call us to make excuses. That's one of the crossroads that we're at as a community. Allah Ta'ala has truly blessed us to be able to have the spirit to not make excuses because it's a bad habit. Because if we make excuses in this world, we might attempt to make excuses in the next when the excuses will be rejected. The excuses will be rejected. As a community, we're at a, an historical juncture in terms of humanity at large and other religious communities. This is true for them also. It's true for the Anglicans in this country. It's true for the Catholics, wherever they might be. Is true for the religious Jews. We are challenged with capitulating and reforming our religions out of any recognizable existence in terms of our epistemology, how we see a knowledge and how we see revelation as a valid and legitimate source of knowledge or just materialism and empirical verification or even uh, beyond empiricism but still rooted in natural phenomenon that we might discover in the natural world, world. Some things that are unseen in terms of beyond empiricism, empiricism, what we can see, taste, smell, feel, touch. There are things we can't see that we're learning about. But those things return to a physical existence beyond immediate sensory perception, such as electromagnetic waves, etc. So physicality versus transphysical, metaphysical reality, which we believe is more real than the physical and more enduring and has deeper, deeper implications in terms of who we are as human beings. So we can reform our religions to conform to a physical uh, uh, epistemic, or we can continue to believe in the unseen, which is our first description in the Quran, الَّذِينُ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ And the transphysical, the metaphysical, and the truth and reality that emanates from that realm of existence. That's very real and manifests itself in incredible ways. And one of the manifestations from that alim al ghayb is revelation itself. That these are valid sources of knowledge. In terms of ontology, that these are valid realms of existence that are more real than what can be eventually physically perceived. Or we can abandon that view. And then on the basis of physical verification, physical methodologies for unlocking and discovering the physical world, apply that to God. And then like many atheists enter on the slippery slope because that which is greater than physical reality, that which precedes physical reality, that realm, realm where revelation emerges from, divinely revealed truth emerges from, the pro calls to prophethood and the prophetic office emerges from, can't be immediately verified by the methodologies by which we verify physical existence. Therefore, it doesn't exist. 
No, it exists, but it's revealed to us not through uh, electromagnetic mi atomic microscopes. It's not revealed to us by some uh, instruments that measure physical phenomenon. It's revealed to us when we fast and when we pray and when we ponder on the meanings of the messages that were brought to us by the prophets and we as Muslims believe the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and we dedicate ourselves to that truth that's when the reality of these aspects of existence that's when the veracity of these foundations of knowledge reveals itself to us and as a community we have to decide are we going down this path or are we going down this path that's another crossroads that we find ourselves at and in conclusion in negotiating all of these various crossroads we will need strong institutions we will need institutions that if we are to be serious about the call to walk on that steep path, the call to liberate slaves. And the, the, we mentioned zakat, وَفِرْرِقَاب, for the liberation of slaves, literally. I had, uh, at, at lunch, I was informed about Muslims who are bringing girls from back home, wherever that might be, and putting them into, lie, into brothels as sexual slaves. We should be, we should have institutions to liberate these girls, funded by Zakat. This should be a project that the National Zakat Foundation can undertake. Why the Zakat? For the liberation of slaves. These girls are slaves. And one of the most demeaning forms of slavery is sexual slavery. These are our callings. This is the high path. The first thing on that steep path. What will let you know what this steep path is? Liberating the slaves. And we can join forces with those organizations that are working against human, human trafficking in all of its manifestation. Not just in this country, but all over the world. But that takes institutions. That takes collective action. That takes a, a, a grand vision. As Muslims, we should have a grand vision. We should have a grand vision. And young Muslims buy into those visions. Buy into those visions. Dedicate yourself to those pursuits because it will lead to good after good after good. Fulfillment after fulfillment after fulfillment. So if we're going to do that, it takes institutions. If we're going to feed people in a big way that really makes a dent in terms of alleviating poverty or, and hunger in this world, it's going to take strong institutions. If we're going to effectively present the message of Islam, and we'll stop here, that takes strong institutions. We need media institutions. We complain the media is misrepresenting Islam. Well, if the media is controlled by people who don't like Islam, the media is only doing its job. The people who are financing it don't like Islam, the Rupert Murdochs of the world. So the media institutions they own and control are only doing their job. We need media institutions that are doing our job. And to do that again, it takes strong institutions. It takes collective action. And so as a community, we are going to, if we want to see things change, we're going to have to dedicate ourselves to fostering that change. And this takes a long, this takes the commitments of decades. 
There is no, we mentioned the great educational institutions. Those multi-billion dollar endowments, they didn't occur overnight. They weren't built in a day. They weren't built in a decade. They weren't built in a century. They were built over the centuries. And so we have to understand that to a certain extent, we're planting seeds. And the fruit, we might not eat from. But if we plant the seed in fertile ground, if we nurture, if we irrigate and fertilize that seed, it will bear fruit for future generations. And so we have to have a long vision. And some of the things we do, we'll see the fruit of it in our lifetime. Some fruit, some trees, they fruit after many, many years. Some fruit, one season, some trees rather, fruit after many years. Some trees, they come to fruition immediately. The next season, we'll be eating from them. And this is how we should see the work that we have to do in terms of institution building, that some things we'll see the fruits immediately and some things we might not see the fruit in our lifetime. But those coming after us, inshallah ta'ala, they will benefit from those fruits. In conclusion, the National Zakat Foundation is an institution that's trying to bring about both immediate fruit in terms of the work they're doing to assist and alleviate some of the hardship that Muslims are experiencing right now and long-term fruit where others can benefit. One of the categories of zakat, when mu'allafati qulubuhum, is intended to benefit amongst others those people who aren't, who aren't Muslim, those whose hearts are to be confirmed and strengthen. People might have a negative opinion of Islam. If we are alleviating some of their suffering, it's very difficult for them to continue to have a negative opinion. If we're assisting them to alleviate some of the hardship they're encountering, those opinions can shift very fast. That's a valid use of zakat. So the avenues are there, the challenges before us, Inshallah ta'ala, if Allah ta'ala so wills, will rise to the challenge. And from this gathering, great men and great women will emerge. Those who do great things, those who are instrumental in establishing strong institutions will emerge from this humble gathering. But we have to make up our minds and dedicate and commit our hearts that this is indeed something that we want to dedicate our lives, our resources towards. And if we can do that, we'll see the fruit, both in the short term, mid term, and long term. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.